And what we want to get across to you is the challenges that we're facing, the risks that we have taken and we will take, the opportunities that have been presented to us, uh, and the destinations. And I think what we both wish to, part to give to you is some advice from the beginning of our talk. Of course, we'll end with um, our insight after many years along this journey together. But I think the, um, the piece of advice we want you to listen to is to take the risk. It's worth the reward, especially if you keep your eye on the destination. So with that, we will start our um, joint talk. This is actually the first time we've presented on a podium together in 30 years. So um, this is a great challenge for the both of us, although we have different styles of, of speaking. This is uh, the biggest challenge thus far, so um, bear with us. <laughs> Um, the title of our talk is Engineers are from Mars. Clinicians physicians are from physicians. Physicians are from Venus. And the destination in this European Research Council Advanced Investigator Award um, is BioBlood. So our journey started many moons ago with Sakis coming from Athens, Greece to undertake his undergraduate studies at the University of Western Ontario in Canada where he met me, a first-generation Greek-Canadian. Challenge number one. Challenge number one was actually to stay together, all right? For me, there was a huge risk. First of all, because I was going to go uh, into Canada and I needed to keep myself warm. Um, <laughs> there was another risk that I uh, realized when uh, I went there was that Nikki actually happened to be uh, smarter than me. So I'll tell you a little story. She doesn't know that I was going to say this story. Uh, with <laughs> taking organic chemistry, uh, and <laughs> I find out that she actually scored the highest grade in the history of organic chemistry at the university uh, with 98%. So my ego was a little bit shattered there. It was a big ego. <laughs> still is. Being smarter than he is, still, <laughs> I knew that we were destined to work together. And so the risk was to stay together. I say that because it is a huge risk. Anybody who's been together for 30 years like we have, it is a risk. You have to work at it, just like the science, relationships, it's the same thing. So we took that risk and we moved together after finishing. I finished medicine in Toronto. Sakis finished his degree in uh, chem well, uh, chemical engineering. Thank you very much. In, um, in Canada. And we went to the US, which is a huge risk because uh, it was a match program, and we had to go to the same city. So I had to match into a program that they would take Psychis as well. They wanted us, and that was a huge opportunity that the Americans uh, gave to us in that they wanted us at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York. Psychis undertook a tissue engineering degree, um, and I undertook my uh, medical training and in training in hemato-oncology. And at that point, we took our next risk. We decided to collaborate. As a couple, that was a huge risk. And it, we saw that there were many challenges. There were the physical barriers of the campuses, which you can see here depicted by the cemetery. This is a no man zone. And in fact, there were huge barriers in communication. We had to s learn how to speak a common language. And even though we shared the same apartment and the same flat, um, we didn't know how to speak the same language in our different disciplines. So there was a discipline challenge and a communication challenge. But we had successes. So the first success came with publishing together, we had a common pattern, and although you look at the success, the road was actually not smooth. Uh, there were great uh, challenges because we were not speaking the same language, so much so that the first paper, I ended up taking everything that Nikki uh, uh, included in that paper. Um, I took think that it was out. Yeah, I think that you was the last completely time. Out. Completely out. Yeah. yeah, that was so the last time he did that. <laughs> So after we finished our degree, we moved to the next uh, challenge, the next uh, risk, which was uh, moving from the US uh, to the UK. For me, it was a destination choice because I moved to Imperial College and I wanted to be there. Now, for those of you who don't know anything about Imperial, uh, this is our administration building. Uh, this is our dining hall. Um, this is the campus security. And uh, finally, this is the campus shuttle. For those of you who know Imperial, uh, this is what it looks uh, like. Um, and we went there and we 
took the risk of establishing a joint lab. That was the first time that was done at Imperial. A husband-wife team, engineering, medicine, two different disciplines, establishing a new lab. So we established a biological systems engineering laboratory. Uh, and we wanted to move forward the concepts that we were developing in terms of interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary research. So that's the next challenge and the next huge risk. Engineering medicine coming together to try and address common problems. And for me to explain to you what interdisciplinarity is, I want to first discuss with you a simpler concept, one that is confused quite a bit, which is multidisciplinarity. So imagine you have a problem. Um, and that problem cannot be solved by one discipline. And you need different disciplines to come together. So you have engineering, you have medicine, different DNAs. The two disciplines come together, they address the problem, but at the end of the uh, day, they go their separate ways. So you don't have any, any, any mixing, any marriage, if you like. This is multidisciplinarity. That is completely different than interdisciplinarity, where, again, you have a problem. The two disciplines come together, different DNAs, different backgrounds, but at the end of the day, you're having something new. So you have new DNA, 50% from engineering, 50% of medicine, a new common language, maybe a new discipline. This is pertinent because currently, advances are sequential or in parallel. You have a scientist who has an idea. They go then into the preclinical stages, which take it to the clinical stage of the physician who takes it to the patient. That then gets to the engineer who um, uh, uh, manufactures the product and finally reaches the mass public and to the pocket of the chief executive of the pharmaceutical company. So that takes about 15 to 20 years. What we've done in our lab is a horizontal and vertical integration. We put the scientist together with the physician, the engineer, and make them work together in order to shorten that timeline of 15 to 20 years and shorten the cost. Ultimately, though, it still goes into the pocket of the pharma CEO. We're trying to fix that still. So we had the ideas, and with the uh, assistance from the European Research Council and the ERC grant, we put together a group. We call it the BSEL group, the BioBlood group. <laughs> and it does consist of medics, of uh, physicians. We have Michalis and Sophie. Uh, it does consist of scientists. We have uh, uh, Susanna, we have Zoana, we have Spiros, and it does include engineers. We have Simos, we have Anna, we have Jose, and we have Asma. So a very uh, interdisciplinary group, again, working together to achieve the research that we will describe to you in just a second. How do we make them work together? We put them together and we force them, we lock the door and we force them for six months to learn the same language. Not really. It's a push and pull phenomenon. This is the way that we learned. There's a clinical, don't push me, <laughs> a clinical pull as a need and there's an air engineering push. I need to get my technology out there. And that leaves a solution that's innovative, disruptive and transformative. Not too much, otherwise it breaks apart the group and people go nuts. So what was the first destination? Just to interject here. This push and pull is always fun because we exchange ideas very vigorously. We argue. We argued this morning putting together this presentation and what we're going to say. I think our students think we're getting a divorce about every <laughs> couple of weeks. <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, what comes out of it is a different way we think of thinking. So the first destination was making blood. I have a patient with leukemia, or I have a patient with a diffi very difficult blood type. There's one person in the world who can donate that blood type. We have to go searching for them. And we, we have great challenge in finding the blood, and there's great cost to that. So we had the clinical need to make blood. How do we make the blood to demand? We need to meet that clinical demand. And the solution we found in our BSEL group was a 3D perfusion fire reactor. A cell factory. What's blood? The blood is made in the bone marrow. How does, how does nature do it? It makes it in the bone marrow, which is in the, in the bone. It has a specific architecture and a specific structure. It has specific signals, chemical oxygen signals. So we look at this problem. Nikki explains to us how blood works. And what we try to do is reverse engineer uh, the native uh, uh, tissue. So. What is it that we try to do? We, first of all, try to mimic uh, the architecture. So we develop a scaffold, a three-dimensional scaffold, and we also want to 
uh, uh, mimic the functionality of the, uh, the bone marrow, uh, provide uh, blood, uh, blood vessels. So we impregnate the scaffold with hollow fibers. So we create this little bioreactor that you can see here, and at the end of the day, we have produced a little bit of blood, not much, uh, but one that we hope that we can scale up. And this is quite critical because it's actually a self-sustaining system. So if we look at the next slide, you're going to give me the clicker? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually heretical when we first started this in that we, we believed in, and that's the next message I want to, to send to you, is that you need to believe in yourself and believe in your project. Otherwise, you're not going to get anywhere. And that's what we fortunate enough to have the students who we can uh, give advice to, that they need to believe in their project, otherwise it's not going to fly. So what we wanted to do is come up with an innovative solution. That involved risk, because we wanted to grow cells not in two dimensions, what everybody's doing, but what nature does in three dimensions. Well, it's difficult to convince the scientific community that this is the way forward. And of course, it's also difficult to convince Nikki that medicine of the future will be engineered by, uh, uh, designed by engineers and delivered by technicians. <laughs> I'm a doctor, Jim. <laughs> so let me show you what uh, we mean by that. Um, so in the next slide... You've got the clicker. Yes, I have the clicker. So in the next slide, and uh, uh, we have a little bit uh, of variability, but anyways, what you actually see on, on, on the top right, you actually see a lot of red blood cells, so we can produce them. But then we want to get them out of the scaffold and into the uh, uh, hollow of the hollow fiber, what you can see in the bottom left. So we actually design these uh, hollow fibers with proper pores to allow the transgression of, of, uh, of the cells. And unfortunately, the animation is not working, but we had to develop algorithms okay. to see how the cells in time over there it is. Over, always believe in technology. Uh, um, how the cells remodel themselves over months. So we're now getting a little bit of blood out. We hope to get this into a preclinical phase to patients in the next five years. The next challenge and the des destination was precision medicine. I'm a doctor. I pa treat patients with acute leukemia. In my practice, if I don't have the right treatment at the right time with the right drug, my patients die within days and sometimes hours. So I need to have it at my fingertips. I need to have that knowledge. I need to be expert at what I do at that moment in time. So we're talking truly about leukemia personalized treatment. I have a, a lean, thin man like Sakis, and I have myself, for example, and we will get, we will have the same body surface area and get exactly the same treatment. How is that possible? And how we do, do we distinguish that? So. We again went uh, and thought, well, what we applied before in making normal blood, can we apply it to culture cancer, leukemia? And uh, what was known in the literature at the time was if you culture these cancer cells, even though they were cancer, cancer cells, in these two-dimensional surfaces, the cells will die, as you see there, within about one to two weeks. If you, though, culture them in three dimensions, the way nature was intending to uh, do things. Uh, we can actually culture uh, in long term. The longest we've done it is a couple of months, only because uh, the postdoc uh, got tired of, of, of growing these cells. Uh, the other important thing, and this is very important to me because I was right uh, in the challenge that Nikki said to us, was we noticed that different cells from different patients were growing differently. They had different kinetics. Makes so sense. Yes, so we wanted, we noticed this heterogeneity. So the heterogeneity problem um, is, is quite critical because every patient is different, every leukemia is different. And so when I have uh, a specific patient in front of me, I have different people, I have to put that together with different cell types that are growing at that time, different mutations in those different cell types within the leukemia itself, and a different rate of growth of those cells. This is how leukemia becomes resistant. Why does some leukemia is sensitive to chemotherapy and the other one is resistant? Why does one patient live and the other one die? Why does one patient relapse and the other one survives and has cured? And so we came up with a personalized 
and uh, optimization of treatment outcomes for these patients. So at a group meeting, uh, Nikki was presenting these ideas to, uh, to her, and I actually said, we can capture heterogeneity. I laughed at him, of course, and said, don't be ridiculous. But I was right. So with collaborators in Thessaloniki, uh, Mihalis Georgiadis and Margaritis Kostoglu, we actually developed a platform a mathematical platform, so we can actually capture this heterogeneity, the different uh, clones due to mutations that exist in uh, uh, the bone marrow. And this needed to be practical for the physicians at the bedside. So we used patient data that we have readily available, age, gender, weight, height. We used what we knew from the bone marrow, the mutations, the lymphocytes, the white cells. And we also could put that into the model and see what would happen to the leukemia cells, both sensitive and resistant, before and after each treatment phase. In addition, we saw that with the recovery, we could predict when those patients were going to recover their neutrophils. And this, this work is still in preliminary phase, but we hope that we can translate this back to the bedside and help patients not only get cure, but reduce the toxicity of the treatments with a mathematical model. And engineering, again, takes cen center stage because if you notice the bottom right graph, this is 120 days, and we can capture uh, the kinetics of, of, of cells. So again, medicine of the future will be designed by engineers, delivered by technicians. And the one thing that I've learned from Nikki, the one thing, is we need, <laughs> we need to move what we have into the clinic. We need to translate it. So how do we do that? Our vision is that we have a handheld device, for example, the dreaded iPhone. And you have patient information you can get readily at the bedside. As I said, the age, the gender, the height, the weight, the cellular information, what the white cell count is, what the bone marrow shows, which is something we do normally in patients who come in with leukemia. And then decide on which treatment we're going to use based on the mathematical model that we've developed. So we have the beta version of the Pi chemo, and now we are facing the new challenge of taking it into the clinic, translating things. And for us, we have reached a uh, stage in our life where we have kind of plateaued. We were too static in our opinion. And that brings us to the first announcement of our new challenge uh, and the new risk, leaving Imperial, leaving the UK, moving to the US, uh, where we are going to need to learn a new system, uh, relearn it, uh, take the risks associated with new positions at new universities, uh, but hopefully there will be a reward at the end of our... Reaching that step change, keep your eye on the destination, and the risk is worth the reward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.